Hello, everyone. Good evening. Oh. Yes, hello, Riza. Long time no see. Okay. <laughs> it's Riza, by the way, is our one of our co organizer who founded everything of the Donut Group and Asia SG. So, thank you very much for coming uh, after work to the downtown area. Some of you come from a very far place. Thank you very much. So, without further ado, let me, yeah, just to confirm, you are in the right group, you are Donut SG and Asia Group. <laughs> Even though it says on it. Uh, just a bit of uh, introduction. So this is our home page. For those who are new to our group, you can come to this page and join our Facebook group and meet up events for uh, event updates. And then in case you see Marvin sitting there doing recording, it's because we have a YouTube channel which you can scroll down and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Currently we have about 43, so please help to increase the number. <laughs> because until 100, then I can have the customization on the URL. <laughs> okay, now currently I, I can't do that. Cause you see, you see that one or, or 100. So yeah, for those who miss out our previous uh, meetup, don't worry, there's always a recording update until my phone died. So uh, yeah. We actually went to a few other countries to do as well. So it's very interesting. Um, that's all. Oh, and yeah, if your company have any donate or agent related job posts, you can always contact me or our co-organizer here. And can you tell the story about your visit to Japan and Taiwan? Oh, cool. Yeah, but before that, let me finish this. So yeah, you can send me your job detail. Yeah, or you can post on our Facebook group as well. If you was email me, then I can help you post over here. Yeah, only only a few later. <laughs> okay, so actually I went to Japan and Tokyo in eh, Japan and Taiwan in March and April. Yeah, yeah, group actually is quite interesting. They throw a lot of uh, very tough questions. So I hope our meetup group can meet this kind of standard as well. Don't worry, they, 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 you just come and just share whatever you have in mind. Some people ask me that I do not know about ML, but I come here so what I can say. I think there's no, uh, don't limit yourself. Just try to network around, and I think uh, try to ask questions. Don't worry, there's no stupid question and so on. If you watch the Japan one, it's actually quite fierce, these two guys. <laughs> yeah, they, they keep shooting the question when the speaker is speaking. Uh, luckily, I'm the last, so they, have, they are too tired of <laughs> so not a lot of questions. <laughs> and uh, Taiwan one is interesting because I talk about Mo Lang. Yeah, so it's in Chinese uh, all, all the while. It's one hour. And yeah, they are also very active and we are staying around for network. So later, I think uh, we have some time for networking as well. We have today, we have uh, professionals, very professionals here. Uh, we have CEO and the architect from NCLEF. Later, they will talk about. Okay, let's go to today's topic. So, uh, Today's topic is about Otto ML from Antion. Uh, he will be he's just become our Microsoft MVP in AI. Yeah. So, yeah. And then the second topic will be from Encrafting. It's over there. So they will talk about their data port, which is available on Azure Marketplace. So later they will share with you more about this. So without further ado, I let Antion take over.
machine learning tools in Asia, right, is a it solved a half of problem of me because I don't like mathematics. Even I failed my mathematics account, didn't balance before. But the automated machine learning is a process automating the time consuming iterative task of machine learning model developments. It allows a data scientist analyst whatever they want to build a machine learning models with high scale efficiency and productivity and sustaining a model quality. Then in traditional model development, right, we always use a resource intensive requiring significance and knowledge time to produce a compact all dozens of models. But with the applied automated machine learning, you use you just want to use the actual machine learning to train and tune in all the models that you target metric and you specify. Then the service iterate the machine learning algorithm pair with the features of selection. For what I will share about how to use how to create from the start and determine the high score and the better model consider it fits your data. But the data you still need to download or from other sample download from other sources or the company data that you have. And the automated machine learning you select the time, yeah it saves time. Then you get a production ready machine learning model with great ease and efficiency. <coughs> and it democratizes the machine learning and development process and powers is to the users. No matter their data, no matter whether there is a data science expert to identity and end to end machine learning pipeline for any problem. Now for data scientists, analysts and developers, they are in they are just implement solutions and we are attentive the programming knowledge. Same time, yeah, same time, really. Because I sometimes I don't like to code and and leverage the data science and practice. And you provide agile problem solving. Now I'm going to show about the Azure portal first. situation in progress. Things this one, then 
training compute, you can create another as select. Even the experiment and the select training compute, in case you did not have the compute, you need to create one of specific size that virtual machines. Then I upload. Okay, I have a Titanic data set. Where did you upload? Can we see the data set? When you start for the data iteration slide, you can get a log. Then it will show all the logs, and, uh, and at the end it will show the one of the chart. Since we Okay, 
data virtual machine size and the measurements, and you can at the same time you build our models. You see it just now that I did a lock, you can see the, all the locks that they are starting to view. And after that you can see a chart of the iteration and you pick one of the dots, you will see a, this this algorithm that has been listed and their accuracies. And uh, once you get in, you can see the chart and the matrix classifications and the gain curve. For more information you can view from my blog or techconnect.io Now I will pass to the next speaker to deliver the next sessions. interested to share, we are always welcome. Just drop me a message of Marvin or Riza. And uh, I think probably next one, I hope you will come also as a speaker. Yeah, everyone, as, if you have something, as long as interesting about Donet or Asia, just drop, a, drop me a message on Meetup or... Hmm, Meetup, I seldom reply, maybe... <laughs> Twitter, yeah, Twitter, then... I will try to uh, arrange a time for you. But because Microsoft is actually moving, uh, it's, move, it's no longer in this building, starting from September. So August will be the last that we will have meet here. Uh, then I will try to find a venue, or if worst case, then we do online. Uh. <laughs> but we will come back again in November, yeah, after they finish moving. They are moving to Tanjung Baga. Ah, Tanjung Baga. Yeah, Tanjung Baga. Also quite Do you want nice. to organize some events in the US? Yes, if you have place, yes, thank yeah, you for place, I just took the time, but the only thing is I'm traveling might be a little bit difficult. Will <laughs> you all want to travel to NUS? <laughs> yeah, we have a very Who nice wants to NUS? <laughs> yeah, we have a very nice building uh, near the Cambridge MRT station. The only thing is you need to take a school bus yeah, for uh, a few stops. Yeah. 
I wish I was, I was better. But he can come up with certain like uh, description to say how to get a transport. Yeah, we can try that. Hopefully, so <laughs> some of you will come. Okay, so now the team is ready. So it's easy to 
it's easy to update the, the CPU if you implement it in microcode. So yeah, so so what what Intel has created is really uh, the, the the to to minimize the trust zone that that when you build an application. So so the trust is only uh, is only limited to the application that you create and the the CPU itself. So that's the so so kind of uh, the the idea is to minimize your trusted computing base. So even if you have so many lines of code in the operating system so many lines of code in third-party applications, you don't have to trust them. You only have to trust the application that you write in, in the unpaid. Right? So um, it creates a, a, an area in the memory where you, can, uh, uh, where you can put the data and the code, and, and um, that, that area in the memory is always encrypted. So it's kind of, you know, your, your data in use is, is protected as well. So there's, uh, there are three pillars to, to uh, this Intel X, uh, SGX security model. Um, the first is memory encryption, I'll discuss it later. Sealing and remote attestation. We will we'll learn about those later. So um, it, uh, in, all this, uh, in all this security features of Intel, uh, there's a lot of call it crypto zoo. There's so many cryptographic operations that's ha happening. But the, the root of uh, the, the keys that you use uh, are derived from these two, uh, two keys that's embedded in the CPU. So the root ceiling key and the root attestation <coughs> where all the other keys are getting derived from. And uh, so even though Intel creates uh, or, or distributes software development kits, kits to, to develop on top of Intel SGX. It's not a turnkey solution, right? So there's a whitelisting process uh, whereby you, you, know, you, you have to partner with Intel, uh, sign some agreement, and um, you have to whitelist your binaries, you have to whitelist your service, uh, so that whenever you talk to Intel Attestation Service, they know that you're a valid entity, and whenever you load your, your, uh, whenever you load your application in this, uh, in the SGX environment, it, it gets uh, it kind of gets loaded because it's whitelisted by by Intel. So, all right. So, memory encryption is is one of the pillars of, of Intel SGX. So the idea when you create an application in this Intel SGX environment is you have to you have to have a, a, a trusted and untrusted part of your code. You have to think uh, this way. So in the untrusted part, you kind of think of the data that you will process in this uh, untrusted part, maybe some metadata, some non-confidential uh, data. Th that's where you process your uh, untrusted, uh, your, your, that's where you process your normal data. But in the trusted zone, right, you, you have to think of, of what you will have to process in there, like, like credit card numbers, NRIC numbers, and all that, right? So that's, uh, uh, that's, that's uh, kind of the mentality when you develop uh, an application in Intel SGX. So in, in this uh, slide, we have trusted and untrusted uh, part. The trusted uh, part of your app goes to the protected, uh, the unclean part of uh, the, the, the uh, Intel SGX. So it means uh, it reserves an area in, in, the, in the memory that's always encrypted, right? And, and the application, the trusted application goes to that part, and the untrusted part goes to your normal, uh, normal lab. Right? I probably will not, don't need to discuss this, but the idea is every time, every time a data is written in the protected zone, uh, it's, it's encrypted by the memory encryption engine, and then when it's, it gets read, it, it gets uh, decrypted, and uh, the the plain text data is is uh, decrypted in the cache. So the plain text is really uh, only inside the Intel CPU. Right? All right. So another uh, security pillar of Intel SGX is sealing. Mm -hmm. So when whenever you have to persist your data, like you have to save your data in 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 a 
hard drive, right? You have to seal this data. Sealing is really uh, just an encryption of the data whenever you want to persist the data, right? So you encrypt it, but the key that you use is embedded in the CPU. Uh, I told you earlier that uh, uh, there's a root sealing key that is the basis of, uh, you know, that's where you derive your, your sealing key, your actual sealing key, whenever you, whenever you encrypt data and persist it in the, in the hard drive, right? So that sealing, um, in sealing you have two, two kind of modes or, 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 or ways to seal the data. One is using uh, MR enclave, so we call it Mr. Enclave. It means the data, the, the key that you use to seal the data is derived from the enclave's, uh, uh, how to say, enclave's hash, uh, enclave's information, and uh, yeah, so, so essentially sealed with the enclave's identity. So, so you generate a key that is based on the enclave's identity and the root sealing key. So you, 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 create, uh, you, you create the key and then encrypt the data using that key. Mr. Signer is you seal the data with the vendor's, vendor's identity. So I told you we, we, what, we have to whitelist our applications in Intel. And uh, in whitelisting uh, our, our, uh, our application, we have to kind of sign it with our uh, private key, right? And then we, we uh, give, give this signed data to, to Intel and they validate it and then they, they create a binary that is installed in all Intel SGX machine when, whenever, you, uh, you know, uh, whenever you install the SDK and all that. Um, and, then, and then whenever, uh, whenever you see the data, the, the data that you use, the, the key that you use is, is based on the, the identity of uh, the identity of the, uh, how to say, the identity of the software vendor. Because uh, we use the we use some some uh, we use some key to 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 whitelist our uh, unfit in, in, in so that key is what uh, what we will use to derive a sealing key for Mr. Sign. So essentially, two ways to two ways to seal the data. So um, yeah. So another important point here for Mr. Signer is. It allows you to upgrade the, the enclave um, because it will not be uh, the the sealing key will not be derived uh, uh, will not be derived from the enclave's information but the, the identity of the uh, vendor. Okay, and uh, last in the security pillars is remote attestation. Uh, what uh, it's it's kind of a, a crazy flowchart here, but. What it, it actually does is just ensures that whenever we want to provision, uh, whenever we want to provision a, a, a data to an enclave, we have to make sure that we are talking to an enclave, uh, to an enclave software, right? So, for example, if I have a service that has uh, uh, information like NRIC, right, and I don't want it to go to just any application, right? I want to attest first. Uh, the, the, the client or, or the application who wants to get my NRIC. And, and uh, that, that attestation part is, is uh, this, this flow chart over here. So what the idea is, the idea is uh, we get the information of the enclave and we ask uh, the challenger or, or the, the service provider asks Intel if this is a valid enclave or if, if this is a valid entity. And Enclave will uh, will know based on some nice uh, nice uh, scheme called EPID. I will not, I will not discuss that. But uh, there's there's a group encryption scheme that, that Intel uses to to uh, validate or to identify that uh, you are actually talking to a valid Enclave. So when when Intel says it's okay uh, that that you are talking to a valid valid Enclave then uh, the, the service provider will decide if, if he, he will uh, send, it, send, send your NRIC to that uh, unclaimed information, uh, to that unclaimed software. But um, the sending, uh, the, the protocol between the, the service provider and the unclaimed is, uh, creates, creates a temporary key so that 
when you send the data, it's always encrypted anyway. So, so there's uh, no, no security there. So that's it. Um, that's that's uh, Intel SGX. Uh, you can raise your questions later in the Q&A. I'll pass the mic to Ina now. So now we're go I'm going to talk about the uh, Enclave Data Vault uh, solution and architecture. But before I proceed, uh, can I ask who among here uses key management solution to protect your secrets in the application that you're writing? Do you interface with it directly? Right? Because I think if you are making production grade software, eventually you have to really save a password for your database or an API token that your application will also have to talk to, right? So if it is sitting unencrypted, like in a uh, plain text configuration file, then it would be easy for an attacker to get all the secrets, right? <clears throat> so anyway, after this talk, I hope uh, you can uh, try Enclave Data to secure your application. Yeah, so earlier uh, I, uh, we uh, described uh, ADB, we call it ADB to be short, a secret management solution. But when we started uh, this journey, it was really a key management solution. So essentially your cryptography keys. So we support um, creating, deleting, and managing of keys. So we support encryption, decryption, signing, and verifying. <coughs> And uh, we support all the standard algorithms such as AES, RSA, ECC, and HMAP. But along the way, we realized that it can be, you know, uh, used much more than that, right? Much more than a key management solution. And that's why we, uh, you know, we uh, the way we tell the story now is that uh, thanks to Pralat, <laughs> is that ADB is actually a secret management solution because what are cryptographic is anyway. It's just one form of secret. And in ADV lingo, we actually call it as a secure object. So a secure object can be a cryptographic key, right? So this is your standard keys. But it can also be cryptocurrency wallets because uh, our sister company is actually a blockchain, a public blockchain company that started here in Singapore, so we'll tell you more about that later. So we support wallets too. It's another type of secure object. And finally, we call this a uh, user-defined object. So essentially, it's any kind of, uh, it's a blob of data that you want to secure. So it can be your password, your certificate, your API tokens, or your KYC documents. So these are your know your customer documents that usually custodians uh, would like to store securely because it contains confidential information. Yeah, so this is a snapshot of our dashboard. And you can see that under secure objects, we have keys, uh, user-defined objects, and wallets. And later, we will show you different use cases where it's appropriate to use a particular kind of secure object. So this is our typical uh, deployment. So we have a one plus n deployment where you have one primary and n number of secondaries. So we expose a web dashboard for admin, so for the admin to create users and also to manage uh, users and the appliances that's connected to the primary. And we also have a REST API. So this is uh, what your applications would uh, use, right, to be able to use our functions. And uh, so through our horizontal scaling architecture, we are able to achieve high availability and load balancing. High availability because, say, the primary goes down, right? Uh, we can promote one of the secondary appliances to be the primary. And uh, load balancing, meaning if, if we see that the traffic is really high, we can, we can just add one appliance, one or two appliance, until we are satisfied with the performance, or with the throughput. And we developed this ADB synchronization protocol uh, through the concept of remote attestation, which Rodel described earlier. And this also allows us to achieve redundancy. So for example, you wanna create a key, right? So in our architecture, the key is created at the primary. 
right? But for this key to be able to use in other appliances, so how do you provision, how does the EDB primary provision the secret securely? Uh, if you recall, when you, Radel mentioned about the concept of sealing, right? When you create a key, this is actually sealed in the primary uh, storage. So meaning it will be sealed with a uh, key that is derived from this uh, CPU. So if we provision it to the other devices, they wouldn't be able to decrypt it, right? Because it is provisioned, uh, it is encrypted with a primary CPU, right? So we developed this synchronization protocol so that we can safely um, transfer the secrets from one appliance to another, and that it can be sealed using that uh, destination appliance uh, CPU. Okay, so deployment, we can deploy on-prem or in the cloud. So in the cloud, obviously, it's Azure, right? On-prem, because there are certain use cases, such as um, cold, wallet, uh, cold storage solutions for custodians, where they don't want to uh, have any kind of connectivity to minimize the attack surface. Yeah, so diving deep, this is uh, our architecture, right? So I, we don't have to discuss uh, all the details here, but what I want to highlight are the boxes that are enclosed with a uh, white uh, rectangle, enclosed with rec uh, white rectangle. So these are the modules in our solution where we handle the secrets, right? So these are actually running in that secure uh, encrypted memory. Because like what Rodel said, you don't have to put uh, all of your application in the secure enclave because there are um, uh, offsets, right? Uh, there are negative, uh, say your performance would go down, right? Because there's a lot of overhead too when you run in that secure and so here, our uh, crypto library is running in the secure enclave because this is where we generate uh, keys, right? And then this is where we actually use these keys uh, for encrypting, decrypting, signing, and verifying. And also, our synchronization protocol is running in that secure enclave because this is where we uh, provision secrets to the other appliance, and as well as the attestation. So. Actually, in that uh, one plus n cluster, before we provision, before the primary provision secret to another appliance, it has to attest that this appliance is actually running an enclave, uh, a valid EDB software. Plus, uh, it is running in in hardware mode because uh, it's possible to run in a simulation mode, right? But if you run in simulation mode, you are not really uh, harnessing the hardware security that Intel SGX provide. So if this fails, um, then we won't provision the secret to that remote appliance. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we actually were really happy that uh, Azure uh, started this uh, confidential computing preview back in uh, June 2018. So we were one of the first to, to sign up for this preview. And uh, later on, uh, Azure uh, made this uh, private preview into a public preview in December 2018 or October 2018. And uh, right now it is available in East US and uh, West Europe because this is still in public preview. Right? So I'll be handing over the uh, Dr. Sunil, who is uh, responsible for all our deployment. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so how, uh, how many of you are solution architect certified in Azure? I, I can <laughs> see, I think, a lot of you. So, I uh, won't uh, talk too much on the deployment. can see the, the blade here, so we, we have to choose the confidential uh, compute VM in the Azure portal. Okay. So when you when you click on when you choose confidential VM, it will ask you the standard things here. So uh, the main things you have to note is just that uh, it's only available in the US and West Europe region. And you need to have uh, to s select Open Enclave SDK as a no because it's a uh, built-in uh, SDK and we 
a lot of the pages, you will see that the, the standard items, you just choose the virtual network and then the subnet. And then you click OK. So it will start to deploy the virtual machine. And uh, at this point, you can go home and you can rest. But no, actually not. <laughs> we just started to uh, design the solution. So, so our, our software uh, actually is quite complex because there's a few uh, interconnected uh, microservices. So we have like a pipeline which we use uh, intensively to maintain a consistent uh, environment across our development team. And we also want to replicate the same environment for our customers on Azure. So we, uh, we, we do our testing and our build on the Azure environment. Even the, the machine that we have, our build machine, we think uh, HNTA's pipeline and all this, it's all in the Azure. And using the same uh, confidential compute VMs uh, that we have. So we have like a few phases of uh, deployment that we have. So once we push our code to our uh, uh, code repository, we do an automated build, which uh, generates uh, like a package of uh, software, which we do uh, intensive testing, unit testing uh, on our uh, core uh, binaries. Right. So we also have an end-to-end -end kind of uh, testing where we test our uh, load balancer, our uh, API, and our uh, HSM components. And also we we would. Uh, after a few rounds of testing and building, we would uh, do a baselining. Once we are feel confident that we want to do a release to uh, Azure, which I will talk about uh, later. So we would have to do a, a baseline of all the components we have so that uh, we can uh, actually capture these uh, details and we can know what the things that could be impacted if there's a certain uh, security kind of uh, vulnerability of certain components, uh, kind of uh, inconsistency in the certain kind of uh, packages that, that exist on the different machines. So, So the, uh, the the thing that I'm going to talk about now is like how how are we going to scale with uh, different customers that we have. So we want to have like a, uh, a template solution, like an ARM template that we uh, we have to sort of replicate our whole solution onto the cloud, right? So what our design allows us, uh, we want to have fault tolerance, right? So we need to have something which can still function even though uh, there's a break in a certain component, in the hardware failure or uh, like a crash in the OS, for example, right? So my, my colleague talked about having uh, like different uh, machines which are uh, replicated using a remote attestation process, which allows us to have a higher fault tolerance design. Okay, because the keys that we have are different, uh, consistent in different machines. So even if one machine is down, we can still uh, function with the same uh, set of keys. And also we want to incorporate the high availability, right, because uh, when we measure the downtime or the uptime of the, the solution, right, we want to uh, ensure that even though we are doing a maintenance on the, on the solution, we are doing an upgrade, we want to impact the, uh, the, the, the key generation, the key operations and all that. So we, we want, we set up uh, the 
multiple regions across uh, or we have it in availability set, right? So if we so if we can uh, when we do a, like a deployment, we can actually uh, uh, don't start at deploying at one instance while letting the other instance run, so we can uh, minimize the. So, so in, in addition to these uh, template solutions, we, we want to have uh, a marketplace uh, which is a solution which we can uh, deploy easily by the customer so they don't need to, uh, to have too much configuration uh, on, on their side. So we, we would have like a, a UI which allows them to customize the, the region that they want to have uh, the data or to deploy the, the solution uh, on which on their own subscription but it's on uh, we, and they can choose the region and they can also uh, define like a list of uh, IPs for, for their own internal usage and also the logos that they want to have Also, uh, because of the the ARM templates would be based on a virtual image, uh, Azure uh, virtual images. So we will also publish uh, certain uh, virtual images based on the, the ADB solution. So they will use the not the ba not the basic uh, one two. So, so why why we need these customized virtual images? So one of the key uh, benefits is that we can also uh, link the monitoring capabilities and the uh, alerting capabilities. You know. So we are using like open source uh, monitoring frameworks like SASD, Grafana the dashboard and, you know, and for the uh, thing. Yeah. Sorry we don't use much Azure uh, monitoring. <laughs> so so we have like the we like the certain matrix that we have. Uh, we have both application matrix and uh, operating system matrix. So these application matrix are referenced to things that uh, what, what the kind of uh, use cases we have. It always links back to the use cases like the key encryption, key encryption, how many signing, how many encryption we, we did, you know, and how many uh, errors we have, application errors. And we also have the operating system matrix like the, the disk space, how much disk space consumption by the, by the arcade, how much uh, memory consumption, how, how much CPU usage. So we, we have, uh, because we are using a lot of uh, Docker kind of uh, containers, so we, we have to monitor individually the different uh, containers usage. So that's all for me. proceed to discussing the use cases for ADB, I just want to highlight um, our vision for the ADB solution template. So what we envision is, for example, you are going to launch your own, say, app service, and you need a way to sort of provision keys or provision secret. What you can do is you just go to Azure Marketplace, find our uh, solution, and then launch it on your own infrastructure. So essentially, you would be in control of everything. Um, so here, the first use case, use case is called uh, cloud file protection. Because even as we build our own 
secret management uh, as a service, we also build our own application that uses uh, ADB. So in this case, it's, uh, I'm sorry, but it's a plugin for Google, Google Drive. <laughs> um, hopefully we have an opportunity to extend this to OneDrive, but it's just that at the time, there was an opportunity to build a plugin for Google Drive. So essentially what it does is it allows a user to encrypt a file before it goes to Google Drive, right? And so meaning it gives you the ability to put encrypted files on the cloud before you send it to Google. And it would also allow you to download uh, encrypted file, decrypt it, and save it to your local local machine. So all of so our ADB KMS is actually deployed in Azure. And even our Enclave Cloud File Protection Service is actually deployed in Azure. But the plugin is meant for Google Drive. So here I will show you a video of how this works. But you can actually go to market, Google Marketplace and install this. It's free for um, individual users. Because what we envision is for enterprise, uh, they would deploy their own solution. Right, so, so here in this video, it just shows you that, say you have, a, say, a private key file that you want to encrypt before it goes to Google Drive. So here you can actually launch our service and then encrypt it. So this is the front end, and then at the back end, it actually uses our ADB KMS to do all the decryption, decryption. You can even do sign and verify files, and you can also share encrypted files to a select group of users. So essentially, only these users that you have defined uh, are able to decrypt these files. So here it just shows you that uh, if you download it or if, if an attacker is able to get hold of this file, it is encrypted and wouldn't be able to do anything. Here. So here you can download uh, an encrypted file then our, our service will decrypt it, and then you can save it to your local disk. So this is one use case where you can use AD. So again, we build this application, but uh, at the back end, it uses uh, our KMS. Okay, so the other the other solution that we have is crypto wallet. As I mentioned earlier, we also make, um, we also uh, supply technologies to um, custodians and also exchanges for cryptocurrency. So we support uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Zilliqa. So Zilliqa is our sister company. It's a, a Singapore-based uh, uh, public blockchain. Right? So it started in so, so what we do here is we can instantiate uh, keys that are meant for uh, cryptocurrency signing. And then we support standard and HD wallet. So this means if it's a standard wallet, it's a random key pair. If it's an HD wallet, it, uh, it follows some standard that's uh, widely used in for Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum, whereby you define uh, like a master seed and you can generate uh, child wallets from this. Okay. So we can we can support two types of deployment. One is hot wallet. So in this case, we deploy in Azure because this is connected to the network, right? So mostly this is used by exchanges for fast transactions. But for custodians where they handle large amounts of money, large amounts of cryptocurrency, sorry, uh, they would use cold storage solution, which is on-prem, and it wouldn't have any network connectivity. And we can also partner with uh, like a provider of, of uh, they call it mini HSM, but essentially 
uh, what is lacking in the Intel SGX uh, technology is trusted I.O. Meaning your inputs to the keyboard or if you interface a camera or a printer, you cannot be sure that actually there's no attacker in between your enclave and also that uh, I.O. peripheral. So this integration with a trusted I.O. device would allow us to close the loop, right? which is what the custodians And the other thing, I guess this is something that's that would be that we have talked over and over and again, over and over again, is the secret provisioning. So, if you are developing an app server, right? So these are the types of secrets that your app would need: your database credentials, your API token, if you need to talk to a backend um, app server too, right? Also, your TLS certificate and private key for all the TLS connection. Um, so normally, at, you only do this in uh, the dev environment, right? You would probably write it in a configuration file which is sitting uh, in plain text. But if you want to productize it, you would mm -hmm. have to encrypt it or you would have to password protect it. But then you're just transferring uh, the trust, right? How would you provision that initial secret? So that's called a secret zero problem. Right. So here we can show you how you can use our ADV plus the doc Docker Swarm Manager to provision this. So what you can do is first you identify uh, the secrets uh, that your application needs. And in ADV you create an account for that particular app server. So when you create an account you would get uh, essentially a username and an ADV token, right? So that the app server can authenticate itself to the ADV TMS. And then you have to create secrets in ADV using the user-defined object, uh, secure object uh, that I mentioned earlier. So each uh, server, each, uh, sorry, each secret is identified by an ID. And it can be anything. It can be just a password. It can be a JSON formatted file where you have several secrets in there, right? So it can be anything. And then what you can do is, once you have generated this, you can use the Docker Swarm Manager to make uh, Docker secrets that would contain the server name, uh, sorry, the username, the token, and the UTO IDs. So notice that these are not the actual secrets, right? These are just a pointer to the secrets. And this is what the Swarm Manager would provision to the app server. So in this case, even if the Swarm Manager uh, is uh, infiltrated by a malicious uh, user, and even if it steals things, so it's actually you can actually invalidate it on the ADB KMS. And the IDs are just nothing. It's just a pointer to the secret, right? So you can revoke the access at that level. And here, uh, when your app server boots up, right, so the Swarm Manager can provision these Docker secrets, and then the app server, using the ADV token and the username, plus the IDs, can then uh, communicate to ADV to retrieve the actual secrets. So here, I can play, uh, a short video on how this can be done. Yeah, so here it's just we use Postman to, to, to send requests. And basically this is creating the user for your app. And what's important here is the token ID and the username. And then you this is where you create the secret. So in this case, it's username plus that some token value. So here it's sending the request to ADV to create the secret, and here is the ID for that secret. And you can retrieve it by passing the UTO ID. But in reality, the retrieval should be done by the, your app server. So this is where this is the Docker secret creation, where you pass the token, and then you pass the user. And here is you pass the ID for that secret, the secret ID. So 
So here it's just a sample uh, Docker container that would receive this secret. And then once the secrets are provisioned, it's available in, sorry, this is executing the container. So here we are in that container, and the secrets would be available in run secrets uh, directory. Right, so these are the So here it's um, storing the environment variable. So again, the, the, the one that the Docker secret provision to the app will not be the secret, but an access to that secret. And you can easily revoke it in case, you can revoke it from the ADB KMS in case uh, there's a, it gets infiltrated. Here it's actually getting these uh, secrets. And here it makes a uh, call to the ADB to retrieve the actual secret that we defined earlier. So the username and the token. So the username and the token is secret only known to the app server and not known to your Docker store manager. I think that concludes, ah, not yet, sorry, <laughs> it's not yet the end. So we have to, uh, okay, so this is another use case uh, that we use ADV for, but uh, here we have another product called uh, Trusted Ledger Database. It's essentially a cryptographically verifiable database, and if you want to learn more about it, you can ask this guy, and he can tell you all about it. Uh, essentially, we use ADV to sign uh, the hashes that are crucial for this uh, TLDB. Uh, we can discuss it offline if you are interested. And by the way, this is also running in Azure. So. <laughs> and our vision also is that you can uh, launch this TLDB in Azure through a cloud solution template. So essentially, it's MongoDB at the back end, but it's cryptographically verifiable, auditable. Yeah, so uh, here uh, we're gonna share with you some challenges that we face when we move our solution from on-prem to, to the cloud. First is, the, is recovering the underlying CPU hardware with Azure confidential computing instances. Because as we mentioned uh, earlier, the secrets are closely tied to the machine, right? And if this secret, uh, if this machine dies, then the secret actually dies with that machine, right? So, so what we have, as Sunil mentioned, is uh, in terms of deployment, uh, we deploy in two places. So one in East US and one in West Europe. Uh, because during our deployment, uh, we had one instance where uh, both uh, machines actually went down because it's in one data center, and I believe probably there was some outage that happened, and then these appliances went down. Right? So because of this, we learned how to make sure that we, we have uh, machines in different locations. And another challenge that we face is uh, data center region. So there are only two places where it's available. And for some of our applications, so some of our solutions like this custodian wallet. Mm -hmm. So if it's here in Singapore, uh, MAS requirement is that the data of the client should be housed in Singapore. It shouldn't go out of Singapore. But if our solution is deployed in, say, East US, then it would not satisfy Yes, yeah, so hopefully after the public preview, uh, Microsoft will deploy more data centers, especially here in Singapore. And what's next is, so we are undergoing PIPS 140-2 certification. So we are going for level one because ours is a software-based uh, solution. So here, it's sort of a validation that 
we are implementing all the all the algorithms, we handle the keys correctly, right? So banks would usually require this kind of certification. And as what Sunil mentioned, hopefully <coughs> at, at the end of the year, we can have a cloud solution template that you can continue to try. But having said that, we can, if you're interested, we can uh, deploy it on your infrastructure, but it's not gonna be a one, one click solution at this point in time. I think that ends our Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to say uh, thank you for joining this uh, meetup. Um, starting from uh, this uh, fiscal year, we have a lot of things come up with .NET. You probably already know the news. Uh, now in GitHub, if you look at .NET Core, they already renamed to .NET 5. Yeah, .NET 5. So uh, don't get shocked. <laughs> it's not .NET Core anymore. They already labeled as .NET 5, and they will release the first preview of .NET 5 in September when there is a .NET conference. Okay, so uh, uh, that's the the, the okay. thing. And then uh, for UI, we last time when you, if you joined the Dev Insider, I was talking about the modernize your application desktop. If you still think wants to use WinForm or you want to use WPF, you can use it. But uh, I recommend to use at least the WPF.NET Core 3 or UWP with the latest Windows. So if you haven't updated your Windows to, uh, to version 90.03, not version 90, to build 1.9.0.3, uh, so I suggest you upgrade first and then you install .NET Core uh, 3, Preview 6, and then you develop UWP on that. Why? Because they also going to release the preview of the, the Win UI 3.0. Meaning what? We are not going to target platform anymore. So when you, if, if customer is asking, uh, I want to create this for desktop, okay? And then they, they ask, uh, what are you going to do, using WinForm or WPF or WP? You just say, no, it's for Windows 10. That's all. It's a Windows platform. They call it WinUI, starting from version 3.0. So they, they, they probably, I don't know, yeah, probably the, the, the target will be, there will be no more like WPF, WinForm, UWP, it's only one, only one, one, uh, UI version, which is the Win UI, and still using XAML, okay. And for HP.NET, uh, HP.NET Core, as usual, is getting faster. Um, yeah. Every, uh, and for me also, uh, I will be, I will start to active again in this community. I would like uh, for the people here who knows women knows how to code, I would like to invite to speak next time. So this is very important uh, because we would like to have a uh, diversity in here. I don't want to see men every day in here. <laughs> <laughs> men again, men again, okay. I want, I I we would like to see there's a female developer speaking. If you're not comfortable, uh, for example, so many, uh, too much, too many men, we can invite more women, <laughs> as long as you want to speak. Yes, I can guarantee you 70% of this will be female. <laughs> yeah, but number one, please tell your friend, just say the word to your friend uh, to join the .NET community, and if you're female, speak. 
Okay, speak up, speak up in here. So uh, because dotnet is not for for male. <laughs> <laughs> yes, dotnet is male and female can use it. <laughs> Anyone can use it. Okay, and then uh, the last thing that uh, I'm very grateful <coughs> that uh, it's been like uh, how many years since the first dotnet? Five years. Huh? Five years. Yes, five years. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the .NET and the Azure uh, community that we, uh, you know, mm -hmm. make it big now. It's, now it's uh, more than 5,000 members. Wow. Okay. That's uh, a lot of people. But a lot of people means a lot of responsibility. Okay. We are not Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> and not, well, who said that? that? Well, one uh, responsibility. Uh, okay. That, you know that superhero thing. Yeah. The more people, we have more responsibility. So we would like everyone to speak, speak. Because in here, I'm learning, you are learning, okay? There's no one better in here, okay? No one better in here, and we don't want to, uh, uh, even if you want to talk something like beginner, let's say you only know 101 tutorial C Sharp, hey, speak. Because I know some of the developer, they are still learning. So they require that knowledge, okay? So if every day I come here, talk every time level 400, ah, two, two person sitting here only watching me. So it, it, that is not the point. And the other one is uh, business, your domain. For example, if you're working in the industry financial, hey, share, because I don't know financial, that kind of thing. So someone needs to talk about financial, okay? Using .NET, of course. Eh? <laughs> yeah, must, uh, we're still talking about .NET, but financial. You're uh, working in the oil domain, oil company. Hey, speak, talk in here, share with us. So we know. The more we know the domain knowledge, the more we're going to be. Uh, we get. We, we're going to get more uh, information and more knowledge, right? Eh? So it's very important for this uh, community. So I, I thank you again. Uh, thank you for the. Uh, sponsor for the food. Who is it? Me. Ah, Chunlin! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thank you, Chunlin. Uh, next time, tell me first, eh? <laughs> <laughs> because we have sponsor. Okay. Uh, and uh, any question, any idea for the next meetup? What do you want to hear? What do you want to know? <laughs> Okay. In here, I want to introduce you to you, my friend, eh, is uh, Professor Halbin here. Yeah. So he is uh, the one, the creator of O2Desk Net dot net. If you go to the NuGet package or the GitHub O2Desk dot net, okay, that is a very uh, complex system for simulation. Okay, for simulation. So uh, if you require library for doing simulation, for optimization, not simulator like flight simulator game, <laughs> like that, huh? this is a real simulation that can, for example, if you want you have a port or logistic, you want to make it optimized, for example, how to make it more optimized, uh, which one that should be moved first or doing that, the, the container, moving the container from A to B, and uh, manage of everything is you can use uh, his uh, uh, library, okay? And it's open source. <coughs> you you can use it. So I I hope uh, Professor Holbin can speak next time. Yes, please share with us. It's a good domain. And if your business is related to logistic, you must come and bring your friend, bring your neighbors, your family, your <laughs> yes, your wife probably. <laughs> I, I don't know. Just bring. And uh, listen to to the to <coughs> and uh, what else? Yes, yes. One more thing. One more thing. Yes. Uh, yeah. I just posted a feedback link to our meetup page. Yeah, under the comment of today's event. Yeah. So if you have anything to say, <coughs> there are a few questions prepared for you to do feedback about the speakers and so on. Then later I will share with the speakers also, so that together we improve. Uh. So uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, with that, that's all. Yeah. Yes. It's Thank, right. you. Thank you very much. See you next time. Bye. -bye. Oh. Uh,
photo. Let's take a good photo. Okay, thank you. I just stand here. Okay. Yeah, let's 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 take a good photo. Quick one. Thank you, Marvin. You're nice. Stand at where we just stand. Yeah, yeah. Please go. Okay. Stand. Stand. Yeah. Huh? Oh, okay. Let me stop first. I think I will just pet selfie. 